You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 81. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. I hope you guys are doing well. Staying healthy wherever you are in the world, um, sending so much love. And I'm super pleased to announce that I have set up camp all summer long on the Circus Talk website. I got a little tent. I'm hanging up my food real far away so bears can't fuck with me. And I'm just loving having this little space on Circus Talk. I have so many new listeners. I'm hearing from so many new people. It's super cool. If you've never heard of Circus Talk, they are an international, independent, and inclusive online resource for the circus community. They have a ton of cool stuff on their website, and I want to take a moment to highlight today a really cool panel discussion. It's a series of videos that's happening between different circus artists, and it's called Wake Up Call for Inclusion. And I actually alluded to it today in my interview with this week's guest, but I didn't know what it was called at the time because I never do my homework before I do interviews, but it's called Wake Up Call for Inclusion. It's on the Circus Talk website. Go to circustalk.com and you can find it. And you can also find my podcast, but you've already done that because you're listening to it. So welcome. (laughs) Uh, I want to be really clear, though. Circus Talk is not paying me a dime to say anything about them. They're not paying me and I'm not paying them to host this podcast on their platform. All the expenses that I incur in the creation of the Artist Athlete podcast is covered by my amazing Patreons, listeners like you who give small amounts of money each month to help me pay my amazing editor and keep my equipment up to date and so much more hosting services. There's so much that goes into creating this podcast every week. And I'm so thankful to all of you who sponsor and support so I can keep this resource free for everybody. So if you want to become a Patreon of the Artist Athlete podcast, go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete and sign up today. Again, patreon.com slash the artist athlete. My guest today is Shanae Stiletto Booth. Shanae is a two-time world champion in acrobatic gymnastics, a USA Gymnastics Hall of Fame member, a former Cirque du Soleil artist, and a world-renowned freelance hand balancer. In 2015, Shanae became the first ever African-American female soloist to play a lead character in a Cirque du Soleil production by performing as The Promise in the classic spectacle Varakai. She is currently in bankruptcy court, seeking to hold USA Gymnastics legally accountable for the abuses inflicted upon her by her former USA Gymnastics coach, David Ria I don't know how to pronounce this dude's last name, but I googled him and I don't think I really want to give him the courtesy of saying his last name right, so whatever. Um, Shanae, though, is also an advocate for Rain and was featured in their Don't Stay Quiet campaign. Shanae also has a podcast. It's called Live Like an Acrobat. It's incredible. We're going to talk about it a little bit right now. Do I want to say anything before I start this interview? No, I'm going to save it till the end. It was an honor to have Shanae on the show. I can't wait for y'all to listen. So here's my interview with Shanae Stiletto Booth. 
Let me start recording. Miss Shanae Booth, welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Thank you so much, Shannon, for having me. It is an absolute pleasure. Oh my God, the pleasure is all mine. Um, I always like to start by kind of having the artist introduce themselves. So can you say a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes, my name is Shanae Booth. I go by the stage name, usually Shanae Stiletto. I am a former two-time world champion in acrobatic gymnastics. I'm a USA Gymnastics Hall of Fame member, and I am a Cirque du Soleil artist on and off, and I am currently have been a solo hand balancer for the past seven years, and before that, I was a professional acro duo. And you have a podcast now, too. <laughs> and I have a podcast, yes. <laughs> I have a podcast, and it's called Live Like an Acrobat. And I explore all things circus arts, acrobatic competitiveness, acrobatics, handstand coaching, and some form and blend of current events within all of those different dynamics as well. I'm having a really fun time with it. It's something that I've always wanted to do. It was a long time in coming, and this mm. was the exact perfect time to do it. Who would have thought that this time and space would have opened up for me to be able to give my podcast the focus and the attention and the care that it needed and that I would have so much beautiful access to all of the amazing people you included Shannon which I look forward to having you as a future guest on my podcast <laughs> <laughs> I love that so what inspired I also really like this meta thing where like I'm interviewing you on a podcast about what it's like to have a podcast it makes me really happy <laughs> what was the impetus what inspired you you said you've been wanting to have one for a while Yes. Well, I love podcasting. First of all, I am a podcast yeah. junkie, like nerd, and yeah. I've been into podcasting forever and a day. But I love the free form and I love the I love the freedom of a podcast. And I love uh, like the long form conversation of it all. And I've always wanted to do something that I felt like wasn't within the circus art, which was exploring the people behind the facade, basically. So for me, being a circus artist my entire life and being an acrobatic gymnastics performer, a uh, um, competitor before that, it's a very niche environment, right? People don't know very mm -hmm. much about us. People are always asking you so many questions about who you are, why you're in that world, how did you get there? And I felt like I've been kind of in a podcast my entire life. <laughs> so <laughs> it's always oh felt God, like I'm so putting good. on like some kind of interview because I'm consistently getting those questions. And I've always loved being around different circus artists as well, that we have have those kind of conversations, but we have them like unto ourselves, you know, we all yeah. just kind of like have that behind the scenes, but there's not really anything that is like, maybe I would say also too independent of like the bigger, like corporatized circus companies where it's yeah. like us like interviewing and speaking like to ourselves unto ourselves where that narrative isn't controlled. And also too, because I've been doing mm. so much publicity for so many circus companies and circus shows for so many years and because of acrobatic gymnastics. And it always felt like it wasn't me controlling that narrative. I was always answering the questions that they wanted me to use to promote their product and their business, which got mm -hmm. me really good at being able to absorb that kind of information and then be able to publicize it out for them. But there were all these questions that I always really wanted to answer too. And that I, you know, know a lot of different artists and performers and just so many different people within the circus arts world and acrobatic gymnastics world. Um, wanted to answer and wanted to be asked as well. But there are just not things that, you know, on every kind of normal radio show that were asked. So I thought that it would be nice to do an extended conversation of what you usually hear us give you in little sound bites, you know, here and there of who we are and what we do. And I really wanted to take the superficiality out of, uh, out of circus arts. Um, I yeah. feel like there's a lot of that. And I really wanted to take out the over glamorization of circus um, in mm. my podcast and really normalize who we are as people and normalize mm. this business and the dynamics that go into it, how hard it is and what it is like really in the day to day. I feel I, I do know that people don't get that because the conversation and the questions, and that's why the podcast is called Live Like an Acrobat, because usually mm -hmm. when people ask me what I do and I say, I, I say simply, 
I'm, I'm in circus. And the first thing they always say, oh my God, you're an acrobat. And I'm like, uh, sure, yes, I, I'm an acrobat. And then they're always like, gosh, what, what, how is it to live like that? Or what kind of life is that? Or I wouldn't even know where to start of how living like an acrobat. So I know that the title of the show is a bit like, I don't know, I would, some people would say generic, a little bit strange, but I've honestly gotten that same sentence or formulated sentences, like posed to me for like, since I was, I don't know, maybe like seven or eight years old, um, competing in acrobatic gymnastics. So that's, that's the basis sure. that was the inspiration behind the title of my podcast, like an acrobat. One of the questions I get a lot, and I'm interested to hear your answer to this because I bet you get it a lot too. I get the question. So people ask, what do you do? I say, I'm an acrobat or I'm a circus artist or something along those lines. And the next question they ask is, oh, do you work for Cirque du Soleil? <laughs> and me, I've never worked for Cirque du Soleil. So my answer is usually like, no, I work independently. I work for other companies. I am a, a self-employed teacher, consultant, performer, but you, you do work for Cirque du Soleil. So what, what does that conversation look like? You say yes. And then what, what do they ask you? I say, I say yes, but I also say that not always because I've been going out in and out of working with Cirque for the past about 10 years. So because I'm also a freelancer and have both, it's usually incredibly confusing for them. So the conversation usually just only stays with Cirque du Soleil and it doesn't go beyond mm -hmm. that no matter how many times I pivot and I try to tell them about <laughs> how there's so many companies to work with and that, you know, you go in and out of working with Cirque du Soleil and that you can leave for three years and then come back and work with them for a couple of months months and then not work with them again or work with them for a week and then not for a year. So people also too, the mainstream idea of circus is still very, it's very connected to Cirque du Soleil and through that tunnel and through that stream. When I am speaking to people too, I am usually just trying to do a full on education of there's hundreds of shows. There's these type of shows, there's cabarets, there's theaters, there's, there's galas, yeah. there's, there's cruise ships. I, because they all think that that's all Cirque du Soleil as well. <laughs> So huh. I, I always, I try to tell them, you know, like, no, it's this company and this company is independent and, you know, you can work in a casino and that's also independent. So I'm usually, it's a, it's usually a very um, long winded conversation, but I, you know, with, with Cirque du Soleil still having such a stronghold and a monopoly on this market, which, you know, in some ways is fabulous, but in other ways, it, I always tell them it makes me, you know, makes me a little bit sad because there's so much circus in the world and there's so many varieties of ways that you can perform and so much more opportunity. So I, I, I try to tell them so that they can understand the large scope in and around the circus world that so many people just maybe aren't aren't uh, privy to because you only usually see what has the most promotional power. And then also too, depending on like what part of the world you're in, because also too, if I go and I'm traveling outside of America, which I usually am, when I say Cirque du Soleil, a lot of people in some ways don't even know what Cirque is still. So I have to actually... Yeah. When I, when, I, when I speak about circus in different capacities, that's when they're like, okay, yes, it's that circus because it's usually the circus without the animals. And so they understand that too. So mm -hmm. it definitely does change and shift in different parts of the world that I'm in. But I do find if it's more of like a Western um, type audience that I'm speaking to, I almost cannot speak and get that in that there are so many different levels and flavors to performing in spaces that are beautiful and coveted and coveted and explorative and mm. that the opportunities are so vast that they need to be because uh, most oftentimes you're hustling in and around many companies if you are fortunate in that way, or if that's the path that you want to take, because it's not everybody's thing to stay in a long-term, you know, contract with one particular company, maybe like Cirque du Soleil, then, you know, then that's great. But that a lot of circus performers and dynamics that go into it are shifting in and out of having sometimes 30 employers for one year and, and, and how yeah. drastic that is and how much energy that takes when you have maybe worked for 20 to 30 companies in one year. And that's also too, for some people, they can't even absorb that, um, especially because yeah. this is already a strange environment. Yeah. This is something that a friend of mine offered to me once, and it was so helpful in these conversations was to compare Cirque du Soleil to Starbucks and say, yes. there's a lot of other places you can get your coffee, but Starbucks seems to be the one that everybody knows. Um, yes. 
<laughs> yes, I have heard that one before, and I've also heard okay, it cool. in a variety to, a relationship to McDonald's. So, <laughs> yeah, oh, there you go, getting your hamburger yes. somewhere. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Use the McDonald's analogy as well. Yes. But I love the point you make about, yeah, it's really hard for people to wrap their heads around the, I don't want to call it, well, I mean, let's call it what it is, like almost job instability, where mm-hmm. you're constantly, part of my job, I feel like, is finding jobs. And I'm wondering, I mean, you're just such a badass and so skilled and at such a level. Do you also have this experience? Yes, yes. And and I feel like that's an honest revelation just for the circus world in general. That's where mm. I feel like so many people kind of miss the mark about this business, especially if you've been it for as long as we have, because this is now my 16th year as a professional circus performer. So a, mm-hmm. a paid professional circus performer. And I was getting paid doing circus work when I still competed in acrobatic gymnastics on my off season to be able to afford to compete. We just couldn't do as much. But, you know, if you want longevity and then to dial into the realistic expectations of this job and of this career, I would say that the majority of the time that is spent that I have is finding and seeking the job, getting all the details sussed out and the mechanics and the, you know, the logistics of trying to make sure the job is actually going to work until the moment that you even get on stage. And then the logistics are still, you know, the bottom line throughout the entire contract. So I also think that this is reminding people that this is very much a business and that, you know, I, I meet a lot of younger circus artists. And the first thing that they say is I'm just here for my art. I don't need to make money. And I say, well, that will change very quickly, especially if you get to <laughs> around age 25 or 24 yep. and, um, and you get injured or you, some big life event happens to you, or you want to buy something and invest and you realize that you cannot. But I mm-hmm. feel like there's still this very infantilized attitude in and around circus that is very dangerous. And it promotes this kind of Peter Pan-esque feeling that you never really have to grow up and that you can always in some ways exist as a child that's running away Oh, with she just said it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Like, yes, like that's so real. And I also think it comes from, I mean, I had this like meeting people who have been, you know, who went to ENC and then immediately got hired from Cirque right out the gate and have their whole lives kind of had like, okay, this is the next place you're going to live. This is your budget for it. Everything is kind of provided for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I feel like it does feed into, I love this, like almost like Peter Pan syndrome or this infantilization of circus artists. And I had that option. I was recruited from Cirque by the age of 13, 14. So my Mm. coach actually stopped them from taking me when I was just a minor. And then also too, because he had so many different experiences with his artists going straight into Cirque and getting incredible burnout or losing their acts after they were brought in together and then ultimately Mm. losing their skill and then ultimately losing their career by the age of about 20 and not being able to continue on for decades or with the same show or getting stuck into a show and going through complete fatigue and Mm -hmm. burnout, but staying for about 10 or 12 years. So he had a lot of experience around that. So I could have gone through the pipeline. What he really wanted for me and my former acrobatic gymnastics partner and performance partner, Arthur Davis, to do was to diversify. And he said, well, it'll be more difficult in some ways because you are going to have to continuously be like working for yourself, publicizing for yourself. He said, but you're going to have artistic control over your career. You're going to have the tools that you're going to need to be able to survive at some point in your life because you don't know if you're going to be able to stay in the same show for five to 10 years. You don't know if someone's going to want to take you away from your partner or if you go into a show and you're promised to do your own act, but then afterwards it changes and then you ultimately become, you know, more of like, I would say a clown or you become a completely different specialty. And that's the only thing that's being offered to you within that sphere of influence and how, how that can kill basically the rest of your career, the rest of your inspiration. So I feel like there's Mm -hmm. a lot of different dynamics that go into where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? And looking at the different, the, the different layers, because I know people too. I have good friends that started, stayed in, the same show, you know, five years. And then I knew people that got in and just were like doing 
anything they could to get out after four years. And then other mm -hmm. people where it's, you know, 12 years and they're, they're happy. They had a fortunate experience. It was good for them. But I also know people that made sure that they dialed into a lot of different things in the midst of staying in, in those shows long term in that way. And then like we're saying too, a lot of people that come out and I meet them after they've been in one setting where everything is controlled and everything is given to them. And they are just like, I don't know what to do. Where do I start? How do yeah. you find work? How do you keep work going? How do, and they didn't know, you know, the show ended, the show got canceled overnight for them. So many different things can come up. And these are all the things that even within Cirque and in a lot of these places, there's no, there's no real training for that. And I, at least I have not met mm. people and artists enough, even if they've had really good coaches and they've had really good setups in circus schools, I find that there is not still another like level of education. It's like people like not learning civics in like American school to like learn about government, you know, and then going it's out like, and yeah. not really knowing, you know, I feel like that's, that's usually like what's lacking in and around that when people are having to survive and thrive in different ways in circus that are unexpected for them. Yeah, I agree with you. There's a real lack of financial literacy um, in the art mm -hmm. form, in a lot of the arts. I also, I came from a theater background and I felt it was the same. Unless you were really making it, um, you really struggled with that aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do understand the tempting, almost like peace that you can fall into when you are working for a big company to let the, like just kind of float down the river rather than swim against the current and keep um, up those skills and keep up that kind of entrepreneurial spirit. Do you have any tactics or ways that you can, that you stay consistent? Yes. Well, I feel with my, with my career and the way that things have gone, um, it's the contracts that I've been in. I would say that my longest term contract ever, like consistently throughout anything that I've done is a year. I haven't done anything longer with one with one company longer than a year at a time. And so at certain periods where I know I because I because I've always been in kind of that insecure place, I would say, where mm -hmm. I've always had that expectation because I grew with that expectation. So for me, it's just always important that I consistently stay on the pulse. So every single contract that I'm in, I'm always very much aware and prepared that it will not be lasting or that it will be ending. And I feel like I was, I've, I've been able to create that muscle from the beginning. So for me, I never let it atrophy because the expectation is always very different. Even when I've settled in, I've seen people have long-term contracts that again, just dissolve overnight when they thought that the show was going to last for like two or three years and it just didn't it lasted for a year so for me i i do both i stay comfortable and i stay dedicated obviously to the show that i'm in but i'm consistently updating i'm consistently reaching out i'm consistently you know going through contacts i'm consistently looking for a job in ways that i am when i maybe have a gap and feel like i'm not employed. And the good thing too about circus is that the good thing and the bad thing, because this can also work against you, but you know, a lot of circus shows are willing to book you two years out, you know, yeah. they're willing to give you a year in advance. So even when you're a year out and you're like, okay, I have this year, but okay, what happens come January? I mean, it's January mm -hmm. now I'm going to work till December. What happens to, you know, come January. So I feel like, because if you start that way, you just are consistently looking into the future, like just consistently and always and thinking, okay, on that date, like my life, I feel like as soon as I start a contract, it's almost over. So my, <laughs> my, <Yeah>. my job, <laughs> yep. my job becomes, <laughs> because, you know, I also been in several positions, which this is also one of, I think the dark shadow sides of circus. And this plays into the dynamics that we've been talking about lately in terms of like how it's different for black acrobats and, and acrobats of yeah. color, but there's a lot of dynamics that go into the extension clause, right? Where you are in a contract for six months and then after a certain amount of time, you or the company gets to decide if you're going to be able to stay. And so uh -huh. there's many contracts out there like that. There, Many of them actually do not keep the new people, they keep the, you know, the consistent kind of like the lifers in the company on extension, but then they go in and out of funneling new people. So mm -hmm. I've been in several situations like that as well, where, okay, well, then that created a new level of like insecurity, because it might be a year contract, but at this point, it's six months. So I feel like when you're And how does that correlate racially? Well, I feel like for me, um, 
what has felt like a result of me being black is that I have yeah. not been extended in ways that I have seen others extended mm. in, in contracts. And that's just been a, a consistent, I would say, experience of mine where it just doesn't make any sense why I wouldn't be extended. And it's, it's gotten me into some difficult situations where I'm questioning it, where the rest of the people that are staying are also questioning it and it doesn't make sense. So yeah. for me, it has felt in many respects that I have not had longer term opportunities that I should have had. And so that it has posed the, the issue for me to have to look for um, another contract in a way that maybe my white counterpart has not because they were able to stay or got extended a lot longer than I did. And I did a great job. Everything went well in the contract. And then it's like, okay, well, I'm just, I need to move on to another contract, but that we all did the same job. And then they get extended mm. and I have not gotten extended and nothing happened. And, and on other contracts, some things did happen where I feel like I experienced racial bias within the contracts and the contracts were very difficult for me. And so even, of course, if I wanted to stay, it would have been difficult staying with that environment. But I've experienced those things too, where it's like, well, it didn't, it, it didn't go well because I was up against a lot. Um, I had to deal with a lot of racial disparity within the contract, but it doesn't mean that I didn't do my job well. And it didn't mean that I didn't like show up and wasn't professional and didn't do every single thing that I needed to do. So those are some things that I feel like are more dynamics that we're speaking about now. Those are not usually yeah. conversations and things that I've been able to have so much more like out in the open yeah. in terms of how I felt. I felt that level of inequality within um, the circus arts world. So I know these are really new conversations and new dynamics. So that's why also too, like explaining them and getting the verbiage in and around them, because these are things that you're usually having in like more like, you know, intimate spaces, or they're things that everybody experienced with you on the ground in the show, but they don't really carry on to anything else after that. If that makes sense. No, that makes total sense. But I would love to hear your insights or your thoughts as to why these questions, because prior to the horrific murder of George Floyd and the after effects, racism didn't just start happening when that was on camera. I mean, this has been historic in the U.S. and internationally. Um, and I'm curious as to why you feel like these conversations weren't being had before. Well, first and foremost, from from us is fear, definitely fear in terms of you will not be getting hired again and you will not have a career and you will not be asked back into this space. And so that's that's usually that's the biggest challenge to overcome and the biggest reason why these conversations are not had, because if you go there and you try to insert the factor of race within any of those decisions that are being made that you feel like are, you know, being made against you. First off, it's usually normalized and rationalized and mm. then it's pivoted and used back against you. And then you're seen as some kind of victim and people really want to use some aspect of what you did not do in terms of capabilities um, mm. to be able to rationalize the level of racism that's being that's influencing this situation and that is something that's very 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 difficult to come by especially when in most settings and situations you're the only black person or person of color within the entire show or within mm -hmm. the entire city or within the entire town so that also plays <laughs> you know a, v a very big factor in you being able to speak up for yourself and also too no one else really being allies, because I also think this is something that is also lacking within the circus world is that everyone is really there for themselves. And I know uh. it's a very hard job. It's a very hard job that we all have. But I feel like the, the camaraderie and the cohesiveness, especially when everybody's freelance and coming into spaces for the first time, because they don't have consistent relationships. And I feel like there's, there's a lot of in, inside competitiveness within the business. And everyone's afraid to speak up for everyone, really. I mean, I've only ever seen it a few times. And when I've seen it, I've been super surprised. And it doesn't mean that everybody's not a good person and that they don't feel for you and that they don't believe it. But everybody's also afraid that they're going to let help you to lose your job. I've you know been in situations like mm. that too, where everyone's like, they're like, you know how this business is. They can literally just find somebody else like tomorrow and replace you and nothing can be done. So I feel like this also comes down to the fact that there's no 
international laws for circus performers. There's no real international union. There's no human rights standards for circus performers either. We're in a very anarchical environment within circus. There's nothing that binds us. There's nothing that's regulated. That's that's regulated. Yeah. There's nothing that any company really has to abide by. I mean, now we've seen some things where they have like visa requirements for some circus artists. But when it comes down to it, they can they can do anything they want within circus shows and within contracts because it's such it's such a niche environment where it's so yeah. kind of like in a universe unto itself. And so I feel within all of those things, when you do understand that as well, and there's like this fear around that where, okay, I don't really even have like a law that's going to protect me here. That's also very kind of shaky. Mm -hmm. I'm on shaky ground here. I don't even feel like I have that. I'm the only person of color in this entire show. There's nobody of color in the management or in any position of power, especially in the bigger corporatized circuses. You're usually one, maybe there's two, you know, black performers. And again, and you're com you're consistently reminded that well i mean you know they've allowed you through the door you're there for others <sighs> you know do you want to lose this opportunity do you not want to be asked back do you and do you also want to set yourself up to be in a space that's very threatening where Ugh. you may incur different level of abuses if you move forward um within that space and within that sphere and maybe you're able to keep the job but then you incur a lot of abuses while you have to live out that job because of course you can't afford to lose that job so i feel like it's it's very multi-layered and for me it yeah. just goes hand in hand with how much more we need to fight for within the circus community as a whole, because I feel like we're all just so vulnerable to everything within the circus arts and within so many new companies and so many new foundations constantly being created in and around circus that nobody really has a foothold on. Nobody really knows like who's managing what and what are my rights? You know, what are right. my rights? I mean, not just in terms of visa, but what truly are my rights? And in most shows and in most settings, no one really feels. I mean, Westerners, yes, we know that we are entitled to more. And that's just based upon where we were born in the world and the passport that we have. So I also, too, can't really diminish that that power that I do have, at least as an American citizen, um, an American Black woman. But I have to say, too, mm. that it still has not worked as this like impenetrable shield either when I'm coming up against the acute racism that exists within the circus arts and the lack thereof of black acrobats and acrobats of color just within the circus world in general. So when you never get to join powers with two or more within any show, everyone has to understand how, mm. how, how vulnerable that feels when you are the only brown person in that space, no matter kind of what, you know, nationality that you have. Of course, I know that I can kind of run to sources that I would hope would be there for me that would protect me in some ways. But when it comes down sure. to it as well, is it going to assist me to keep working? Probably not. I'd probably lose that job. And there's been many situations where I've wanted to quit my contracts yeah. because I've been treated so poorly, but have not been able to do so because it's my job and it's my livelihood. Right. We yeah. also know that people can say many things about why you left or why you were sure. maybe let go and how reputation precedes you in an environment that's so large, but also so small. And mm. that as well, because it's become a very Glittery, it's always been glittery, but even more now. I feel that everybody, you know, it's just, it's very important to stay in a very glittery position. And mm. I feel that, you know, that speaks to kind of like the space of the world, space of the world where everybody kind of wants to be famous. And I feel like I've, not had that same thing because I grew up in the acrobatic environment. I didn't just start as an artist. So I don't have that same, I would say, it doesn't, it doesn't bespeak of me like in terms of who I am fully when, of being an artist. I, I don't feel like I'm beholden to that. I feel like that's not where I start from first, even though I've definitely evolved as an artist. But I think that it sets you up a little bit differently if you start it from sports. Yeah. But that's such in an interesting ways. delineation. I do talk mm. to, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, it's okay. But I do talk to a lot of people who come from sport versus who enter circus through a more artistic venue. And it is really interesting, kind of like the foundational baseline of where they're coming from and the way they make their decisions, what they function on, the, all of that seems to be really different. 
but I've had that conversation 20 million times and it's, it's not the one that I find really interesting <laughs> right now with you. Um, I want to say though, first of all, what a testament it is, not only to your level of skill and your absolute badassery as a athlete and as an artist, but your inner strength that throughout all of this, you have managed to create a career and thrive. I think it's really incredible that, I mean, as you say, circus is hard enough. And then to be a black per or a person of color in the industry has this next layer on it. And you have really created a name for yourself. And I'm interested in those moments when you, I'm thinking about all the little black girls out there who want to be aerialists or all the people of color who want to show up in this business. And I'm interested to hear from you how in those moments you mentioned you had maybe people who championed you or engaged in comradeship with you, but what other devices did you use to really fortify yourself during those really tough times? Well, it's changed and it developed for, mm. I believe, you know, every single time. And like I said, I've had a tremendous allies within circus too. I've, mm -hmm. I have tremendous allies that have, you know, rallied for me within shows and beautiful friendships with circus colleagues. And so even when I say that, you know, circus can also too be very divisive because everybody's, you know, very much out for themselves. I've also had many performers fight for me and rally for me. And maybe if they couldn't just maybe outwardly rally for me, but they were rallying for me behind the scenes and they were nurturing me and loving me behind the scenes, even in spite of things that they knew that they couldn't maybe outwardly change for me. So I also want to be very clear about that because as much as I've experienced very difficult things, I've also experienced a lot of love. I've experienced a lot yeah. of openness and a lot of genuine connection. But I would say that it has taken a village for me to be able to survive and thrive in this business. And I have not done it perfectly and I have not done it very well, depending on different aspects and things that are going on in my life, because it's been like a learning curve for me as well, seeing how I can do that and how you can maintain your mental health and how what kind of self-care comes into play when you're traveling all over the world and you're disconnected mm. from people that you know. You're in a lot of spaces where people do not know you and you don't have mm. access to the same resources in every single every single country, every single city. And so how can you find that groundedness? And I found a lot of stability in creating a very strong foundation and system that I've created over time, which includes, you know, different levels and works of spirituality, of okay. psychotherapy, of assisted, you know, kind of virtual psychology, yoga. I've, I've, I've invested so much time in those resources and applied them and used them throughout my entire career and experiences and doubled down on them, of course, in different ways. But I would say that the most important thing is to make sure that you have a very strong basis of support, that your family recognizes that they're going to have to be there for you in ways mm -hmm. that they really don't even understand because it's going to really take you for a ride. And yes, it's getting easier. And yes, there's maybe going to be things that don't affect you, maybe how they affected me. Again, I've had a very long career of 16 years. So I know that it's changed. It's adapted for certain like younger generations over time, but you're definitely going to have to have a very strong soul base with your family and with your mm. very close friends. And I would say to have a lot of different assistance within mental care and great foundation within if, if this is your route. But for me, spirituality is, is many things. So just in terms of taking care of yourself in that way, whatever that means for you, I feel like I cannot express that enough enough. And then the education just on the environment, I would just consistently educate myself on everything that I am stepping into. And I mean this mm. in a legal sense. I mean mm. this in a, in a business sense, but especially in a legal sense, always be legally fortified before you go into any kind of environment and know that you can have them as touchstones throughout every single artistic experience that you are going to have, maybe will have and wish and desire to have. And know that that is something that if you invest in from the very beginning, you will never regret it. Even if you need to take out a loan. <laughs> mm. Did you, have you taken out loans to like get that kind of education or those kinds of resources? I have not taken out a loan, but looking back, there's things that I would have taken out loans for sooner 
Um, okay. And those are those are maybe kind of like lessons that I've learned. So some of the things I've done, some of the things are me saying that I would have done earlier on, or maybe things that I had to do later. But definitely having some type of legal counsel for yourself. And I know some for people that might sound a little bit extreme, but I think that these are very extreme environments. To me, circus, the environment is very extreme. And again, it's a different layer when you are a person of color and you are in many situations that are very unexpected. You don't really know how it's going to manifest in the environment. That's another thing too that I, you know, I try yeah. to translate and help people to understand. You don't know until it's happening in a lot of these scenarios that you've been done in and that, you know, there's a lot of hindsight, you know, there's a lot of us black performers and just black artists in general that are reframing our experiences and looking back at those questionable circumstances where we knew, we knew what it felt like in that mm -hmm. situation. And yeah. so now there's a lot of validation going on for people because we're all speaking more and we're all comparing even more notes, even though I, I even said in one of my, my podcast episode about black circus artists that there is a lot of, you know, you speak to everyone behind the scenes and you compare notes about things. And, you know, those are the things that, you know, within yourself that you got confirmed because somebody said that, okay, that happened to you too. Okay. I am not crazy. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's yep. Okay. I, I'm, I'm never going to get the validation from that environment that that's what that was, or that's, that's the way that it, it, it was interpreted for everybody else. But I know, I know for myself, because I have an ally that looks like me that exists in the world, similarly to me, right. that they had the exact same experience. And there's so much in that allyship. And I also want to remind the black act rats and the black performers to seek each other out more and mm. to do more things together. And yes, it is good if we are diversified and we spread the power out because that's kind of how we've, I think, all divided and conquered as much as we could. But to seek each other out as allies more. And I would say the reason why that's been more difficult, I think the older generations even now is, you know, first technology wise. And then again, too, when you're not putting shows together. And so you don't even see each other. You don't even come into the same spaces as one another because you're never in the same show. But now with social media, and I know because this has broken everybody open, everyone's communicating so much more. I've had so many more conversations with other black artists more than I ever have in my entire career. And that's again, too, because there's so much energy that goes in to maintaining and keeping this job and then the relationships that you make and you formulate with the people that you are working with, which is beautiful and which is lovely and which is fine. But there's a part yeah. of that too, that is, that is sad. That is, that is very sad. And I know that we're all taking note of that now, but I would also too get those very strong black allies. If you were fortunate to, enough to go to circus school with several other black performers and invest in one another and assist one another and compare notes consistently and provide information. This is another thing too. Everyone should provide more information about their experiences and shows. And this is something that I've always done just as a circus performer in general that I know is sometimes really hard for circus performers to do. Everyone feels like their experience was very precious or people are afraid to share notes or be too open. And I've never really been like that. I've always been very open with yeah, people. What is that fear about? I'm so interested because I feel like I'm very much like you where I'm like, this is what happened. I mean, I feel like my own thought about that is, and it kind of goes back to what we started to talk about, this autonomy or entrepreneurial mm -hmm. spirit within mm -hmm. um, a career. I don't feel like I have to answer to anyone. I ha This podcast, I don't allow commercials on it because I want it to be solely funded by people who like it. And that's so that I don't have to answer to anyone. And I feel like when you have something like that, you're not as afraid to say whatever you want because there's not a fear of things being taken away. But I don't know if the answer is always that simple. Mm. Do you know? Well, you bring up such an amazing point. Yeah. Yes, Jenna, totally. Yeah. It's, um, I, it is interesting. And I'm, I, yeah, we're, 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 we're the same because I love, <laughs> I love to, that I make my own decisions. And if, if, if I had the choice between having something more spectacular or being able to call all the shots and it was like less spectacular in people's eyes, I'm always going to choose that less spectacular thing where I can call the shots and that I can be my own master and have like, you know, <laughs> maintain my autonomy. And I feel like, again, that's another, that's another very important thing an important quality to cultivate. But yes, I feel like there's that over-identification of self 
of, um, of self-preciousness. And I feel like it goes kind of hand in hand with the preciousness of just being a circus artist because it's still so unique. And for me, I've mm. always felt that nothing that you do should ever be so special. Nothing. Because when you do that, then it creates this barrier around you where nothing can really get in because that thing is just so precious, right? And so by you keeping it so precious, it, it, it starts to like kind of wither away and then it becomes actually like not so precious because it's confined and there's no freedom in that. And with you doing that, it keeps people from being able to penetrate and gain access to that preciousness that could be very helpful for them. I think it's kind of ironic that we're all artists expanding and wanting to reach, but then as soon as you ask someone for the details of their experience, they don't want to say a word that might take something away from them, but that's about power. And I think that that's about, that's about success. And again, that's maybe one of the slightly sicker aspects of maybe capitalism and the over individuation of who we've kind of become in the West and what's, I think, penetrating mm -hmm. into all other spheres of the world. Everyone's kind of becoming like us, even though I keep on reminding them, become like us, but stay like you, if that makes sense. <laughs> you know, and in, in terms of like, you can do it, you can build it, you can make it, but keeping everyone with you and keeping those that can benefit from that. Because I feel also too, we've given away a lot of our power as circus artists over to the corporatization of circus with companies that have a monopoly on it. And so instead of us banding together stronger as a circus, as a circus family, we've allowed these companies to maintain all of the cookies where everybody is just like, nope, don't do anything to distract or get, or, you know, take away from that. When your biggest ally yeah. should be the circus performer on your right and on your left and to the back of you and to the front of you, not the person that's going to be calling the shots, writing those checks and everything. Because I know that we've all been brainwashed very much so now into thinking that that is the, the ultimate master. But we've even seen that with the breakdown of Cirque right now. How is it that such a big, huge billion dollar company is a billion dollars in debt and couldn't even survive another financial crisis just like they could in yes. 2008 and had to lay off all their their workforce, could not afford their bills, did not make, did not provide for their most valuable asset, which is all of their employees, and is still now looking for a way so that they can, they can come back and flourish and get everybody employed again but hopefully in a more ethical and moral way or else what is the point so again it's like these companies that everybody thinks has all the answers they obviously do not because they have to go around looking for bailouts <laughs> um, and they, <laughs> right. they, you know so how are they so intelligent making all these different moves when they also are going and you know begging for money when they should be the ones that have the resources in the reservoir which they even stated that they were going to be able to create a stronger foundation after 2008 because they saw that they were such a mess so they got more sophisticated still turned into a mess and look at you know the situation that they put all the performers in. So I've even seen with the situation with Sir currently, which is so unfortunate because everyone does depend on them. They own so many other circus companies now because they bought them all. And these are amazing, good circus companies that were super independent, were beautiful, started by artists that wanted to speak truth to power. But then, you know, over, over uh, overhead gets expensive. All those things get expensive and you want to expand. So then sell to Cirque or whatever. And I don't really know all the mechanics of all those different deals. I know some, not all. So I can't speak on all of it. And that makes me sad too. But I also too can't, can't knock them for that. But when you give one company that much global influence over everything. And then you see, oh my God, like I couldn't even get the money that I was owed from them. I have no, no protection nothing. I have nothing that could protect me for like the next year or two in crisis uh, that this company right. is responsible for, even though I was technically going to be employed by them for years to come. Right. And there's nothing even really in my government that can help me either because everybody's scrambling to figure out how that's going to work. So for me, again, it comes back to where should, where should this, the, the foothold be? Where should we be the strongest? And for me, it's in sharing information to one another as circus artists to educate one another to, again, not use that against one another, which I've also seen that happen. I've seen, I've seen mm. that happen as well, which is unfortunate. People have gotten the good information from somebody that gave that information to them as wisdom because they wanted them to do better than they did. That's why I always give away all of my information for free. I do a lot of things for free that I don't charge for, that artists come to me for, and I give it all away because I want you to do better than I did. But when you do, when you want them to do better, and then people get that information, they use it against you in some other ways or use it against other people, that's also not the way to do it. And to move forward and to create a better environment that works for everybody.
Yeah, there's this idea of information as currency and mm. this feeling of like transparency makes you vulnerable. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. I've seen this as well. Yeah. You've said so much. And I, <laughs> I'm just like <laughs> sitting here listening, like nodding my head, nodding my head, nodding my head. Yeah. <laughs> like, yes. You asked such good questions, Janet. You, what? Oh. You, 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 <laughs> and you're giving me such a great space. Like, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm happy to. Yeah. I mean, like I always say, and I, I don't know how you feel about this on your own podcast, but my job is just get people who have done a lot of this and give them a microphone and let them say the things they need to say. I am in, interested, though. You bring up this question and uh, I, I'm really interested in this in terms of race right now, actually, in terms of education around race, because there's a lot of emotional labor it uh, it seems like, and I'm saying it seems like because not because I want to dismiss it, but because this isn't my experience because I'm a white person. There's a lot of emotional labor that can go into this kind of education for people that you have to constantly point out when things are unfair or unjust and being dismissed or being negated in those ways. Can you place a monetary value on that? I do know that there are, you know, anti-racist consultants and that there are people in other fields and other industries who say, you know, this is our experience and it's very hard for us and we need you to pay us for our experience and our knowledge around this subject. Do you feel like that's a place you can occupy in the circus world? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting thing and I and and I and I agree with that. I, I do because I, want, and I remind people that that emotional labor is consistent day in and day out. So, mm. you know, it's like, that's the, that's yeah. the bill that my therapist sends me um, <laughs> when, when she's helping, you know, there or they are helping to shoulder uh, my, my burdens. But I do think that that's right. And I, I will put that, this also too, in the space of relating it to something else that I'm involved in which is also near and dear to my heart, which is the conversation around abuse and sexual abuse within youth sports and how mm. many of these big organizations bring all of us in as survivors like myself of abuse and ones that, you know, are in and out of suing these big companies. I'm, I'm in bankruptcy court suing USA Gymnastics and have been in and out of the court system for 10 years seeking justice in and around that. So that's also been another narrative that has been quite taxing and has also affected my career in many ways um, because I I've been on hold and lost out and had to put things in different places to accommodate so much um, legalities going through my life, being abused as a young acrobat by my coach and um, and then having to go through all of those things. And so it's still a 10 year journey now with UC Gymnastics and suing them. But I was brought on as a consultant of, of, of sorts. And these are positions that everyone expects you to do for free. These are full-time jobs. I was doing that in conjunction with having a full-time circus contract. So I was working and living in Macau wow. and I was doing about seven or eight hours of performing and working. And then I would go home and I would, you know, I was training and teaching handstands and acrobatics after like my seven or eight hours of working in Macau. And then I would go home and I would take a nap. And then at midnight, America would call me and we would all be on the phone and me as the survivor consultant consultant would for free go and spend, you know, two hours, if not more, because then I would sometimes have to study the different things and developments that we're working on because I was working on influencing policy and structure in and around USA Gymnastics and youth sports. So, you know, and these were things that they asked me to do for free and I wanted the change more than anything. So I, I, you know, I relegated that. I did not, I did not push for that, but it's also the same way within being black and having to educate on racism because even right now too, I'm inundated with phone calls at the moment. I'm inundated and to the point Every where Every single you know, one I'm, of my black friends in circus is right now. <laughs> like, exhausted. Yeah, exhausted. I bet it's, I can only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> We're exhausted. And so, you know, and, and, and I love that you brought that up because again, that's something that all of us, even as survivors of abuse that are, have been brought in for this past couple of years, we've, that's also been a topic of, yes, then now you will be getting my bill for that because Correct. this is, you know, this is, this is time out of my life. This is emotional gravity for all of us. This is difficult. This is, you know, we're all grieving. We're all 
all living, we're all surviving, we're all familying, we're friending, mm-hmm. we have so much going on, we're creating, we are having to be resourceful with a pandemic apocalypse happening mm-hmm. at the same time and knowing that we're still consistently as black people constantly under duress at this time. I keep telling people, no matter what's going on in the world right now, I know if I went into a circus contract right now in another country, I would be dealing with the exact same levels of racism that I usually deal with. It might be slightly muted right now because people are afraid of kind of what they can do, but it would still be there. And there would be still very many elements that will have not change. And you get that if you travel a lot. And I travel a lot up until right now, I travel a lot. And so that also is something that is very sobering the way like traveling that much, because when you're going out of in and out of that many places, you see like, oh, well, that's the standard in that bubble. But oh, welcome to this bubble of being you. So, you know, I, I think that that's a really amazing thing to bring up Shannon, because I feel like that is something very important if bigger companies or even smaller companies wish to reach out and seek out the information and the emotional psychology, the racial psychology that, you know, we all have because we've been living it our entire lives. I feel like it is very important to put a price on that because people will put prices on all sorts of things. And why wouldn't you put, I, I think that it's very interesting that certain things we, we give titles to that if you, if you ask for monetization, you are now somehow being unethical. I, I, I mm. you know, I feel like that is, and that, and that speaks back to being an artist, where everybody's taught like, don't ask for too much money. If you ask for too much money, you're no longer an artist. And you know, if you negotiate, you're for selling yourself, out. Or, yeah, you're selling totally. Out. Yeah, exactly. Because Which you know, you want to be able to like, buy it. I actually find that the more money you ask, the value perception shifts, and the moment you start asking for money for it, people start taking it seriously. Exactly. And so, yeah. You know, like, yeah. Yes. It's like, it's, you know, it's such, it's, it's so ironic and such a catch 22 there with people. And I have had that conversation with younger acrobats many times. We say, no, this is what we'll give it. when they're talking about how they feel very disrespected in a show or in a contract. I say, this is what's going to make you more valuable and get you more respect. I said, you won't, you don't realize it now. I said, but it will, even if you lose an opportunity, I said, you will gain when you lose. You will gain when you lose and not all the time, even like turning down something that's not meant for you and how I've suffered many times because I refuse to take a limited offer. But then other times because I need to eat and I need to survive and I have my family and everything, I've had to take jobs. You have to take jobs sometimes that you don't want to do. That's what adults do. You need to do what gets the job done. You need to do what it means yeah. to take care of yourself. But yes, in and around the the space and time around educating around race right now. I, again, am very grateful that you brought that up and is there are many panels and many spaces that everybody's being brought into. I feel that we cannot negate the fact that that is very precious tenor with our wisdom and also us consistently reflecting in and out of our trauma and our pain, because if anyone's done a good amount of emotional work, you know how much it takes to explore those depths of yourself, even within a limited space of time. So when you're doing that over a long period of time and you're having to re-traumatize yourself of going back into these situations, and then also to the trauma of engaging with people and then having them trigger those things because they don't yet understand them while you're trying to teach them to them. So that's also kind of difficult and you have to sit there and find a new space to breathe in and to reflect in and to engage in. So, you know, this is not, this is not lightweight stuff. And I keep reminding everybody too, that's overwhelmed and not feeling well and reminding them yeah, exactly. You know, there's a lot of friends that are overwhelmed by the stories that I'm sharing with them. And there's many stories that they've already known and they're, they're overwhelmed. And I say, yes, of course, this is, it should be overwhelming. It should be painful. It should not, it should not feel good. Because right. we don't feel good. We've, we've learned how to cope. You learn how to survive and thrive the best that you can. But I always have said too, and I think a lot of black people feel this, that there is this kind of film, I would say, that just kind of is like a, a, a layer. It's like a transparent layer that kind of like clouds almost every single situation that you're in. It's maybe like a soft, light, but heavy blanket over mm. your experiences uh, when you're showing up into the world and walking in into spaces that are not meant for you because they are 
not meant for you. And there's a lot of re-education in and around that when people are saying, well, what can we do? And it's like, we have to reframe an entire environment that's just not made for us. It's not made for us. That's why leotards aren't there for us in our size and our color, or in our color, excuse me, or in sometimes our size. <laughs> I have to encourage people at this point in the conversation. We're going to keep going because I'm loving this. If that's okay with you, we're at an hour. <laughs> Is that okay with you? Do you have to go? Yes, yes, yes. I wanna... No, no, no. No, no, no. Um, I, I'm so grateful to speak with you, Shannon. This is awesome. Yay. But I do want to take this moment just again, because we're talking very generally. And I want to say that I'm really happy that this is so general because the experiences that Shanae is relaying, listeners out there, she gets very specific on her podcast. And I would encourage you, instead of asking her to get more specific here, to go listen to her podcast, because those are that's her platform in her words. And I think that's really important. Thank you so much, Shannon. I, I thank you for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I have a question that's a little bit like divergent, but the same. I am also a podcast junkie. And one of my old time favorites is This American Life. And I remember this episode of This American Life. And I do not remember the woman's name who was on it, which sucks because she was a fabulous guest and her story was amazing. But she was a black woman from America. And she moved to Paris, France, and she moved there because when she because Paris is also very racist. I'm just going to go ahead and say that, like I, when I go there <laughs> and I see, like it, it, they struggle a lot in France with their own um, history. But as an American being there, there as a black American, there's a connotation that you must be wealthy to be able to travel to Paris as a black American. So shopkeepers, waiters and servers treated her with so much more respect than she would receive in the States. And she said, as she lived there, she found that she would, even though her French got better and her accent got better, she would actually pretend that she spoke less French than she did in order to maintain that feeling of respect. Because if she didn't, then people would treat her the way that people treated her in America. And I'm interested to know if there are ways in which being a Black American has been to your advantage while you travel, or if you've noticed anything like that. And also what you've noticed, you've alluded to this a little bit, but what you've noticed traveling as a, as a Black person in different places in the world. Mm. Thank you, Shannon. That was yes, a really long question. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It was... <laughs> it's I'll okay. tell you that episode. If you haven't heard it, I'll go look for it and send it to you later. It's really good. Yes, um, please send yeah. it to me because that sounds that sounds amazing and. And, and I always find it fascinating because it sounds, and I can totally relate to that. I have experienced that throughout my entire life. And there are advantages. You know, I even on my podcast, and this is similar, but, you know, even the colorism that we have within the Black community, where if you're lighter <laughs> skinned, then you're going to be treated, you know, unconsciously or consciously better than a more brown, you know, Black woman like me or, or a Black woman that's even darker than me. And how your experience as a Black person in the world is going to be slightly easier. And unfortunately, that's true. It's not always true. The bias in some in many times is exactly the same. But in many situations, because sometimes people just even forget that you're black, I will also remind people that people many times because I am not typically their stereotypical what they think is a black person, they then forget that I am black. And they create this narrative around me that I am Latina, or that I am from India, like they want to diminish my American blackness in that way all the time. And I'm usually course correcting people and reminding them when they, you know, I've had directors only want to speak to me in Spanish because they refuse to acknowledge even my blackness from America. They want to say that I am a Latina American. And so they won't speak to me in English. And it's, I've had fascinating experiences that just, it just kind of like bowls you over. But, I, you know, but I have consistently brought that back, but it does work to my advantage. And that is a privilege that I do have in existing in the world. And I will also share this from an experience that I had last year that I haven't spoken about on my podcast, but I was going to eventually, but I was working and living in Morocco last year and the agent there was terrible and was exploiting artists and hurting artists and taking advantage. And we found out that she'd been to prison and, and she was, you know, uh, you know, sending us around to work in like, you know, theaters and cabarets. I was supposed to work at hotel things were not working out. But when I'm 
went to get assistance because I had to go to the American embassy. It, it, you know, it was unprecedented for me. I'd never experienced something like this. I'd heard stories. I've experienced other things that were in some ways similar, but not that extreme in, in terms of like literally having to go to the authorities um, of, over this person. And of course, not being like in my own country and having to facilitate that. And it was very jarring experience. It was very traumatizing. And again, another just big, you know, kind of like, PSA, the circus world of taking care of yourself and being careful. And so, you know, when I was there, what got me through those doors when I was passing through, because unfortunately, most of the women that are in that space that look like me that are black are from Africa and are looking in a certain way to get from there and get to Spain or get to Italy and, you know, using Morocco as a pathway. And it was because I was American that they would even actually speak to me about mm. what I had an issue about and get me into the consulate, even the American consulate. It was very, very difficult. And, um, and I was told while I was in the country by people that had my best interest, you have to lead with your American in the most powerful way, because that's going to get you through that door. They're like, because you are a black woman here and they are going to unfortunately assume that you are lesser because they think that you're just African, which again is horrific to think about and is very disgusting mm -hmm. and sad. And it's just heartbreaking when, when we're in these situations where people are even saying that to you and they, and then it's a reality there. You know, these are these are conversations and questions that are posed to black people that, you know, white people just don't even have to think about. But my Americanism and making sure that those come through more. And I think that that's maybe in some ways, too, why I don't maybe even speak as many languages. You know, people always kind of get on me about that. And of course, I speak a bit of Russian. I speak a bit of French, very little German, um, but I'm not fluent in any of those languages. And I even have like a little joke about it, say, you know, even the Dalai Lama has a translator and you know so I can kind of feel good about myself because <laughs> I'm like you know not not you know trilingual but I have definitely I know made it made it very clear that I am American when I am in many spaces out of protection and utilized many senses of that identity to make sure that I am protected because it has been articulated to me many times in many different spaces that that is going to be the thing that saves you and that protects you. And for sure, it gives people a different response to me too. And that's also another reason why some of my experiences are lighter and are easier because I am a Black American. I know if I were maybe from another country, like maybe like Brazil, Brazil or, you know, or like I said, or African, which we're seeing, you know, a lot of racial bias against the African acrobats that are now on the scene. And there's a lot of racism um, being um, regulated against them coming from Africa. And I, is that I'm right? Making... Yes, there is. Yes. I don't yes, know anything being... about this. I, mm. I find this really interesting because I remember, I remember speaking to a casting director from Cirque du Soleil on this podcast. Mm -hmm. And I remember asking her about, they have, um, oh, I'm going to get the name wrong, but they have certain programs in certain parts of the world that they see as hotspots for building up new talent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but I find it really interesting and such a double-edged sword that they would build up this talent and then not protect it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe, I believe the school is probably going to be in Malta. I could be wrong. Uh -huh. I, I do know that that is, um, there, there was, there was planned. So that was going to be an epicenter. They're working on that before things close down. And I want to say, well, the, the majority of the exploitation that I'm seeing right now is not from the acrobats that are coming from that space. But I do feel like there will be a level of exploitation from that environment. For sure there mm. will be. And for sure that's part of the plan. No matter how anybody wants to layer and gloss over those things when they talk about going into these epicenters in order to, for, other, for a lack of better words, because I wish I had a better term, but mining talent from... Mm. cultures that are in some ways underprivileged because there's many privileged places also too within Africa where you could create a school and give an enormous amount of opportunity as well because you know Africa is very vast and there's many places that you can go I believe that are not maybe necessarily serving the underprivileged community, I would say, which I feel like that's re very respectful to say for Africans, because I, I watch and read and listen to a lot of, you know, Africans speaking about how they feel about 
how they're perceived in the world and um, how, you know, we're always kind of like diminishing what they have to offer. So I feel like that's an interesting mm -hmm. thing. And I'm going to be interested to see if they move forward with that school. Um, I think that Cirque du Soleil has a lot to answer for in terms of how they are continuing to exploit in all factors and in all spaces in the world, even when it's being shown like, oh, well, we're giving opportunity, you know, to them that they otherwise would not have. But I challenge the, the the richness and the integrity of that opportunity, right? Because for me, yeah, unless, yeah, exactly. You know, unless unless it's integral. Um, to me, it's just, it's just also too exploitive and it, we're not saying like, oh, you know, like, oh, you can't go there. Oh, you can't check. No, but there's gotta be a certain level of integrity. So, you know, there's a lot of Africans being exploited right now. And, you know, when I send out my pictures and I send out my resumes and things like that too, and I know that first they see a black body and if they're saying we don't want any Africans submitting for this project. So, you know, I have African American sometimes on my, on my CV. And I don't always write that like in an opener, but obviously when they're asking, okay, you know, I know that I'm perceived as African. So maybe they think I'm African right away and they just, you know, maybe click and delete my file. And, you know, we know that that's happening. So how, how do we, how do we shift that narrative? And even companies write in, we don't want any more black African acrobats. Like we have, we have enough and how no other part of the world people feel that they can write that on anything. You don't, I don't ever see that. Right, I've never seen other... that. No, well, actually I have. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I have seen um, no white applicants, please, or things like that. Um, but I don't think that it's coming from the same place. Let no, me just because say that I've way. seen like, no, that when they're saying like, we don't want anyone that's not in the EU, you know, or we don't want, um, you know, um, uh, anybody coming from America, or from Canada. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen those posts. I haven't personally seen stuff where it says we don't want white people. And if that does exist, then, you know, again, <laughs> that's also not fair and it's, and it's, and it's not correct, but I've seen, I've seen that, but just done in, um, I would say with, it's not fair and it's way. not correct, but I also think that it's not as not fair or not as not correct. Right. Because right. usually those kinds of projects are designated spaces that are exploring some kind of cultural or heritage that it would not be appropriate to have a white body in. Mm -hmm. Whereas the kind of casting calls and things that you're talking about, the color of skin matters so much more to the producers that it matters to the actual content of the show. Right. Does that make right. sense? Yes. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm seeing a lot lately. I remember I saw there was a circus talk panel that was great. Um, I don't remember the name of it. It was diversity in circus or something like that. Um, I'll put it in the show notes for everybody. But um, one of the conclusions and it had some great artists on the panel, Marco from Brazil. It had Joe from Los Angeles and others. But one of the conclusions they came to, uh, it seemed to be that there was an importance not only in representation on stage, but that there's an importance of having people of color in administrative and in higher artistic roles within these companies like Cirque du Soleil, that there's just a bunch of white people who are calling all the shots. And that's a reason that people are encountering all of these kinds of problems. Do you see that happening? Do you see that there could be a possibility for reshifting and reassignment of some of these uh, power player positions to go to people of color? And how do you think that could happen? Well, I hope so. <laughs> Right. I, hope, I, hope, I hope that it can happen. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that that we can continue to move forward in that direction. And I think 
that that is the most important thing because even when a company like Cirque du Soleil or other companies, you know, they have their diversity clauses and their inclusivity clauses, they all have them. You talk about oh, like, you know, their main good. workforce with their employees and the artists. Yes, there is a lot of diversity there. You know, I've had this discussion with people too. They're like, well, Cirque has people from all over the world. Like I was in a show and I, or I saw a show and they were from this country and that country. And I said, yes, but they're not the ones making the decisions. They're not the ones in the position positions of right. power. They're not the ones calling the shots. And even even with the diversity within those particular shows, still the level of the minority, the level of diversity is still very, very low. It's still very, very low. And that's coming from, you know, all of us that are in and out of those spaces a lot. So even with that diverse workforce and the employee artistic base, it's still, it's still a drop in the bucket, in my opinion, from what I continue to see, but having people in positions of power. So yes, the people that are the artistic directors, the, the directors, the creative directors, the choreographers, the costume makers, the makeup artists, the agents, the scouts, mm. all of those positions, you know, matter. All of those positions are the things that create these shows, are the things that change your experience within a show. And it can't just be one representative. You know, there's people in certain positions that I know they're the one black person in those positions and they've been there for a very long time. And you know who they are because they're the only ones there. And that that's not necessarily what's going to change the conversation when you get one or two representatives. It has to be so much more of a blended mix within these organizations. And, you know, especially for Cirque 2, because for, you know, as diverse as they claim to be, you know, every single time I go to Montreal and every single person that's handling me for a show or creative effort is is not a person of color and it's not black they're usually people that you know are white and making decisions for me based um you know out of the whiteness and there's a lot of things that they miss in and out of between that i had a very difficult time when I did Verakai. I was the first Black Promise in the show Verakai, and they had a terrible time adapting that character to me. And, you know, throughout just every single person that I encountered, we need coaches in there. We need head trainers that are people of color in those positions. You need every single person in all of those different positions, the producers, the directors, everyone, we need to infiltrate those environments and there needs to be opportunity given. And I was having this conversation the other day with someone and I reminded them that they need to make those invitations. They need to seek people out because there's people out there like that. I, we speak about how, yeah. you know, just because you have, you haven't done it, doesn't mean that you're not available to that. It's just that they don't go to you for those opportunities. And we know that they go to others to do those jobs. I know countless people that they they come to them for those positions. And then the people of color, people just think like, well, they just don't have that expanded skill or they just don't have that expanded talent. It's like, no, we actually do have those expanded skills and talents. You just never seek us out for them. That comes down to just simply making a better decision because some many things are not that complex. And that's another thing that I think right. that everybody needs to get away from. I, I like what people are speaking about in terms of like reparations in America, where they're like, we're sick of panels and and we're sick of trainings and we're sick of these long winded conversations around complex issues and complex theory. They're like, there's no complexity there. They're like, just make the different decision. Just give that black person <laughs> or give that person of color the interview that they deserve and give them the job because you know that they're qualified. Okay. And just stop seeing them as they're that artist that we gave a job to once. And, you know, we could never imagine them in that role again. It's, it, it is quite that simple and that complex and difficult at the same time. But I've really been dialing into that too, because I felt that way for a very long time in and around several conversations, most importantly, in and around race like that. But I know in our environment, because it's artistic and things like that, that it can in some ways be slightly more complex in some ways just because there are so few of us still within this environment. So in some ways that makes it even easier. So it's like, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's not so many, so you know who they are. I am sure yeah. you, you can find them. The ones that really desire those opportunities, but it's too about, ex again, expanding, expanding your idea of blackness and who we are and what we're capable of and our different talents and our different reaches. But Again, just putting that out there and making it into a very 
I think, complex decision-making process. I've seen all the different artists and people that have gone through those spaces over the years that would have stayed longer and that had so many different gifts and were very clear and outward about them, but just were only seen as one thing and then like maxed out of the company and then that was it. And I know all those other people knew them too. And why, why were they just not offered those options? So I've seen a lot of people just gloss over a lot of amazing people. Why did they do that? Why was there so much limitation within that? Where, why was there such a lack of capacity there? But again, it's because when your peers are making those other decisions on top of you in and around you and everybody that's making those decisions only looks like you and, you know, so it's easy to shout down, you know, one voice in this, you know, in a group of a hundred. So again, it's getting more diverse in there, but I think that they know exactly what to do. It's just in terms of, will they be willing to do it? And then when they do it, will they do it respectfully? So will they offer the same benefits? Well, you know, it's like what people are talking about with Juneteenth today. They're like, do you want a holiday or do you want reparations? Because I want real change. I want real laws enacted. I want people arrested. Right. I so, want to see the trillions of dollars that they say, well, you know, reparations will take to be able to infiltrate into the economic resolution for the black community overall. You know, for me, it's not just about like getting a national holiday. We need to call for the things that we know that are really going to change all of this. So, you know, again, if you need help, bring in a lot of black people and people of color. <laughs> <laughs> to help you to go through all of yeah. those, to go through all of those hiring processes and helping you to create those things and keep them in the company and help to influence those positions. But I also want to say too that you know it in in many ways, and and this just goes back. This is just something personal for me. It's less, um, I would say, like logistics, but just the sadness that I I feel in seeing others reach to higher heights and expanding into so many other things in a way that I know that other black performers and artists could have done and that their wings were clipped for no reason. And mm. how just, I hope that that hearing those things too is enough for people to remember and to reach out and, and, and to get a sense of, of how sad that is. And that that promotes change just from just, just from your, just from your own, you know, like soul core, your heart space. And because it's true, it's very true that there has been, I think many tragedies in a sense where we've missed out on so much because even in terms of so much art, and that's another thing too. And I know like people in Hollywood say that and all of the art that we don't, we don't even get to see because you don't get it through yeah. the eyes of others and you don't get it through those varieties of colors. Like what you were saying of how they don't understand that by not hiring black people or people of color that you lose out on, you think you were creative before, just imagine how much more you could be creative and how much more those shows could be amazing and how much more those costumes could be incredible. The makeup could be even more extraordinary. Like the choreography could be even more extraordinary. So it is really sad to see that in wanting to hold on to those ignorances. I mean, you know, even when I went to Cirque this last time, they were surprised that I even knew what the show Verakai was. What? That I had been hired to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, they questioned how I knew who Olga Pikenko was, who had originated the role consistently. You know, there was so much nuance in and around that in how ignorant they perceived me to be at that stage in my career. I mean, you know, I was already about, what, 28 when I, you know, got the role. You know, there's, there's, there's many layers to things like that where when you continue to come into these spaces with those projected ignorances, how can you even move forward? And there's, you know, those are the barriers. You know, when I come into a space and they think, how do I even know what the Verakai is? And, you know, and, uh, you know, asking me other questions like that that are out of ignorance. And how does any hand balancer not? I'm sorry. I'm, go ahead. <laughs> 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 I'm, having, that. A I, I, I I'm having a moment. I'm having a moment to myself. Please continue. Yeah. <laughs> I'll yeah, cut no, that out. Was, yeah. It oh was, my god. It was brutal. <sighs> it was. It was. You know. It was. It was. <sighs> it was. It was very. It was very brutal. Um, going throughout. Uh, from the beginning of negotiating the contract, um, you know, I tell people that like I lost money doing Verakai as the, <sighs> um, as as the Black Promise because the negotiations were so awful, and they said take it or leave it. After a while, they refused to negotiate with me any far any any further. 
and I felt, you know, obviously I wanted to do that role for, for years. And, you know, even when sure. in the stand, they, they, they talked to me, you know, all the time. And, and this is what we talked about in terms of being like black acrobats or black performers, where every single place you go to, people treat you like it's the first opportunity you've ever had. And the, so that even that you're at stage 15, everyone treats you like you're at stage one at all times. So, you know, they were thought that was my first time to Montreal and that that was my first time to, you know, the headquarters. And that was my first, you know, job, like working with Cirque. And, you know, this has happened to me repeatedly. So this is not, you know, but this one was on a different level just because, you know, there'd never been a black promise in this role. So everything was just about how I didn't have the right look for the job and that I wasn't really right for the role and that it wasn't really me, but we were going to try, they were going to try, but it wasn't really me. It wasn't really you. You don't really have the right look. How are we going to do this? It doesn't really work. She's not really, uh. that was the consistent communication to me throughout that and you know i had to remind them you know you offered me already Kidam twice, so exotic. and in the midst of all this <laughs> i just want to remind my listeners in the midst of all this shanae is also training really hard like she's a hand <laughs> balancer i feel like that gets really I, I don't know i don't want to speak for you but i feel like that gets really like pushed down and like something that people don't understand this is on top of everything else that makes it really hard to be a circus artist Yes, like, it does. Yeah. And how do you, and how, and how, and how do you do it? And I was expected when I got that role, I was an emergency replacement and I was expected to get into that role in eight days. Actually, that was wow. my contract. I had eight days to get into it. It expected to be on stage after eight days. Um, I had new canes that I was expected to do all of my, you know, all of my hand balancing on, which all hand, ba hand balancers know that your canes are your everything. And someone telling you, here's brand new canes that are completely different than yours. Do all of your hardest tricks in eight days while learning 10 minute circus routine. And, you know, being one of the main characters in the show, we expect you to be on stage in eight days. So that ended up getting extended to, I think about like 12 days. By the time I was like, I was transported and was supposed to like be on stage, like per performing. It was, it was brutal. I was working like 12 hours a day trying to get into that role while being told at the same time that like, I was like my, I was offensive basically. Like my presence was offensive. I was told that and, um, and just navigating that and then told ultimately that my caliber just wasn't high enough. Then also too, I finished my contract and then you know, that was that I had performers within that space that were older that, you know, rallied for me because they said that it was, they were using the terms political, but everybody was using that instead of saying racially motivated mm -hmm. and feeling incredibly diminished there. But they fought for me. Um, they saw that I was treating, being treated very unfairly throughout that contract. It was very difficult. There was so much bias every single day. And like you're saying, on top of that, you still have to go out on stage and perform. You, <laughs> you, you, you still have to survive. You have to learn all of those very dangerous things and stay in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a headspace that is focused and that is cognizant. It was, it was incredibly different. It was difficult. And then because it was so distressing, I had one of the um, main managers allude to the fact that I was having so many issues throughout the contract track due to like some mental mental health issues which mm -hmm. everybody there was like right you mean because of the treatment right <laughs> they were like you're you're feeling distressed because you're not being treated well like that's the problem they're like but she's making it seem like you have these other problems that are coming and infiltrating the situation other than they're the ones that are giving you the problems they're the ones that are being incredibly disrespectful to the to you in this role and demeaning and so i ended up you know eventually filing some hr complaints in and around that which did not go anywhere but i did try i felt like there was a lot of bias and discrimination in in terms of how I was treated there from the very moment that I stepped out. And that was not my first time working with Cirque. I want to remind people of that too. Um, had a long, and it's always been dicey. It's been <laughs> difficult, but that was the most pronounced thing because it was just me. I was solo. That role is so iconic. And the integration for them was just so difficult. It was just very difficult for them to take it there and to envision me there after they had brought me into the role to expand into. So it was a very difficult experience and something that I had dreamt of for a long, long time. It was one of my dreams to do that role. And so it was unfortunate that it did not feel, even though I did have many amazing moments of being on stage as the promise um, in that role. Hey y'all, it's Shannon from the future. 
I'm just jumping in because at this point in the interview, my internet cut out. So I lost Shanae for a moment. It was a very stressful time in my life. I was very sad. I had to mourn. And then I got her back. So I was very happy about that. So there's a little bit of a blip in the conversation and then we come right back to it. So that's what's going on here. Let's get back to the interview. I know we got cut off in the middle of your story about Verakai and my jaw was like hanging to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you wanted to add or finish up or put a button on about that experience? I don't want it to be just like glossed over or interrupted. Oh, thank you so much, Shannon. No, I don't think so. I think I think I got all of that in there. I think that that was everything. So thank you again for giving me the space. I've never told that story before publicly in any capacity. So that was really big for me because it's something that I've held on for quite some time. So I thank you again for opening up this space because the conversation is so long-winded because it's the most multidimensional interview and conversation I've had about like my, my circus work. So thank you. It's my pleasure. It's absolutely my pleasure. And I really kind of what I said before about the emotional labor that it takes to discuss. And as a white person, knowing that there's like a certain aspect of that that's going on in our conversation as well. And so I just want to express my appreciation that you came on and shared with my audience today. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you for the, <laughs> thank you for the space. I appreciate you and I appreciate your open dialogue and your openness in terms of being more educated about all of these topics and all of these things that we are speaking about right now. And I am very grateful for how you are showing up in the world, the space that you are holding during this time. I'm very grateful. I know that your listeners are grateful and every single guest that you've had on the show. And just thank you again for exploring my story and all of its dimensions and colors and capacities and just being, just being open and, and for, and for listening. <laughs> I'm trying. I think it's interesting. I've been thinking about this and reflecting on it a lot lately. Um, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. So I grew up in the American South. And um, racism is very overt there. Like mm -hmm. it, there was never any question that it existed. Mm -hmm. There was never any question that all of us were under the impact of it, mm -hmm. whether we benefited from it or were oppressed by it. And it kind of shocked me when I came into artistic spaces and in this world that there was a real denial of it because there was this feeling of, oh, no, there's one love and we don't see color here and we're all accepting. It was really different than the way I grew up. And it's and I've been reflecting on how it's been such a double edged sword to have had. Um, have benefited and also have seen a lot from my friends and other places in my youth of overt racism and how that's really been awful, but also helped me kind of see this conversation as like not coming out of nowhere. You know, like this doesn't surprise me, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So mm. the question of how to open up space or that there needs to be space that opens up was never one that I it just seemed obvious. Mm, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to put that on the air, but like just between you and me, like I've always really mm. felt that it was an important one that seemed to be glossed over in our mm. space. That's powerful. Uh, yeah. And with your background and yeah, where you were born and raised. Mm. And thank you for saying that because I'm still having, I'm having, I'm coming up against that still a lot with you know, people not wanting to acknowledge that in this artistic space still. And so um, thank you for acknowledging that, that you're like, that's weird that everyone acts like it doesn't exist because we're all just coming from so many places and artists are just, we're family instantly, you know, it's that kind of thing. I've, you know, gotten a, a, you know feedback about that. So it's, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. That's them not wanting to deal with some stuff. <laughs> for <laughs> sure, that's them not wanting to deal with a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, like, I think so too. I'm just like, okay, well, and <laughs> great. That was a great. I'll project. talk to you never. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I wish we could talk longer. This is such an important conversation. But again, Shanae is having this on her platform in a much larger way. So I highly recommend you guys all go there and check it out. Where are all the places they can listen to Live Like an Acrobat? 
they can listen to Live Like an Acrobat on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Podcast, Podcast Addict. Yeah, I'm everywhere. <laughs> and do you do weekly? Do you do monthly? Or do you just do them when you feel like it? Like, what's your production schedule like? Right now, there's not really a method to my madness. I'm I'm getting in quite a few, I would say, during the week. So, I, yeah, I would say like weekly at this point because there's so much time that everyone has. So I'm lucky enough to yeah. connect more, have the time. So, yeah. Okay. So last question. Okay. What advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? And I want to define for you the beginning of your career as... We didn't even talk a lot about like the career that you have had because so many other concepts have kind of taken precedence, I feel like in this conversation. But when you were that little girl who like stepped onto the mat in gymnastics, like what advice would you give to yourself? That's a very good question and a very beautiful question. And I would tell her that she is everything that she should be, that there is mm -hmm. nothing wrong with her and that her focus and her determination and her devotion are going to be her greatest assets and that they're going to carry her through a lot of storms and that she doesn't and shouldn't worry at all about what others think of her, how they see her, how they define her, and that she is important just the way that she is moving around in the space that she's in, and that it's okay for her to take up a lot of space and to not be apologetic mm -hmm. about it, and that she can find her voice a lot faster <laughs> than she expects that she should. And that that will mm. help her get through a lot of trials and tribulations a lot easier. And that that will protect her, that the thing that people are telling her is going to work against her is actually the thing that's going to set her free. So mm. that's, that's what I would say to, to my, my lovely little, little Shanae. <laughs> little Shanae. Oh, it's not little, but <laughs> Shanae, thank you so much for taking the time again to come on. I so appreciate it. Thank you so much, <laughs> Shannon. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I look forward to having you on Live Like an Acrobat as well in the future. And thank you. I honor your journey. Yes. I, I look forward to it. And please stay well and stay safe and stay healthy until we connect again. That was my interview with Shanae Stiletto Booth. I have been sitting here for the past like five minutes after re-listening to the interview. Um, I have pages of notes as you can hear from the rustling sound. I think the place I want to start is just again expressing my appreciation that Shanae came on this podcast and gave the type of interview that she gave and said the things that she said. These aren't easy subjects. These aren't easy concepts, but they're real. And if we don't talk about them, they continue to do harm. And we can't allow that. But I want to be very clear that I didn't just start asking Shanae about race before the conversation started before I hit record. We had already talked a little bit and I asked her, are you comfortable talking about this? Because let's not get anything twisted right now. This woman is a badass and has made an impact on circus and is so much more than a conversation about race. She is a, uh, she's a conversation about work ethic. She is a conversation about passion. She is a conversation about sexual abuse and survival. And if she had been like, no, I'm not comfortable talking about this, we still could have had a baller interview having a thousand other conversations about her life. But I knew she was a person I could go to and have this conversation with because she had already opened up about it on her own platform. And I just want to make that clear because I, I, I want to 
make sure that you know that if you're white, you can't just call up a black person and expect them to want to talk about race with you. That's not their job. That may not be something that's comfortable for them. And to be honest, that may not be the best way for you to understand what's going on. Even if you don't mean to do harm, even if you're really trying to understand and be an ally or a comrade or whatever the hell we're calling it now, uh, you're trying to help out, you can inadvertently do more harm than good. So take some time by yourself and educate yourself before you expect someone else to take the time to educate you. And I hope this podcast was also very helpful in that education process. Because here's the thing, here's the reaction that I bet a lot of, and I'm just making this assumption, and I bet a lot of white people are gonna get a little defensive about this, but this is happening. So like, let's talk. If you are listening to Shanae recount these experiences where they're, you know, on Verakai, they were saying that she was not at the level or she was not prepared or she was constantly assumed that she, this was her first job. All of these things that were happening to her, you know, it's easy to write that off as like, oh, well, maybe you weren't sticking your handstands. Maybe your costume didn't fit, which is also a bullshit criticism, but we'll not get into that right now. You know, maybe you weren't cut out for it. Here's the thing that Shanae says is like, once you start talking, to not just Shanae, but all the black acrobats and all their experiences seem to sound the same. You start to wonder, is it really that they couldn't stick the handstand or is something else going on here? Because I understand there's a defensive mechanism of we don't want to believe racism is the cause. We want to believe that we're on an equal playing field. But when you deny the experience of black artists, you become part of the problem because they're also thinking maybe it's not because of race. Maybe I just couldn't stick the handstand. And that's so pernicious and gaslighty. If you don't know the term gaslighting, it's when people try to convince you that there's not a problem when you really feel like there is one, but everyone's telling you there's not, so there mustn't be. And this is what Shanae was talking about in the interview when she was saying that once the conversation opened up between Black artists who don't necessarily get to see each other because in the industry, people are spread so far and thin between and it is such an individualized lifestyle. But she started to realize, like, she's not the crazy one. This isn't just happening to her. And I get that it's easier to say, oh, they're treating you this way because you didn't stick the handstand than oh, they're treating you this way because there are unconscious biases, maybe conscious, in place that are rooted in historical precedents and systems of oppression. That's painful and it's overwhelming. And Shanae says, I wrote this quote down, she says, it should be painful and overwhelming. It should not feel good to reckon with this because we don't feel good, because Black people don't feel good. So like reflection number one is racism exists. Can we all get on the same page about that? Cool. While I was editing this interview, there is a part that I was very tempted to take out. And it was the part where I start talking about um, Cirque du Soleil and where they are establishing places to develop new talent. Shanae calls it mining new talent. And I think she calls it that rightfully so. And I want to talk about this point on like a bigger scale because I think that it's important to do. Um, when these big companies like Cirque du Soleil go into places and develop talent, um, sometimes they say that they're at risk populations or they are marginalized people or whatever term they want to use. And they say, oh, look, we're building these amazing programs. We're bringing these people up out of poverty. We're saving them. In Africa, we're, we're developing this African talent. And the point that Shanae makes is that there are incredible African gymnasts and dancers and movers and people there who are not living in impoverished conditions. And they're not casting them in their shows. They're not paying them what they're worth. This need to quote unquote develop talent 
is is a form of something called white saviorism, which is a form of racism. And it's, and again, like all of these are very tricky, complicated concepts. And I'm not trying to like call out anyone. I'm just trying to like speak the truth and um, reflect out of respect for my guest, what my guest is saying. And what Shanae says on this topic is, unless it's integral, it's exploitative. So what would establishing a circus community in a marginalized population look like? Well, actually, we have examples of this. If you go back in my catalog to episode 44, it's a tricky one to listen to because we're sitting outside in the middle of Cambodia. But I went to Cambodia and I interviewed Craig Dodge, because he was the only English speaker in the company, but I in, and he did marketing. But we talk about the Far Circus, which is a Cambodian circus, which was founded by um, some French people in Batambang and Siem Reap in Cambodia. But the way they treat the artists there is it becomes a program that these artists come up through and they go to school, they learn their craft, and then they perform, they get paid, and the whole time they're also getting an education. They are also learning how to deal with money and learning how to read and other important life skills, you know? Reading is kind of an important life skill in this day and age. And, and let me note that the technical level doesn't suffer I've seen the show, it's incredible. Some of the acrobats who go from the far circus are hired by companies like Cirque du Soleil. And also some of them become accountants. The difference, the far circus invested in these people as people, not just as athletes or as artists. That's what it looks like to have a program with integrity. And so if you're in social circus, this might be something you wanna reflect on. And I will add in the show notes, of course, a ton of resources and references and um, further readings about all of this. The last point I want to make, I feel like so much of my reflections in this very lengthy um, outro have been directed kind of towards white people in the community. But I also really, really loved Shanae's advice to herself at the end, but also to other Black artists. She had some really, really awesome things to say. Her first piece of advice was kind of, and I'm summarizing here, but to give yourself grace because this industry is fucking tough and you're not going to go through every experience and do everything perfectly that is not humanly possible. And it is totally okay to go back to your hotel room and bawl your eyes out after a particularly difficult day of dealing with some particularly difficult bullshit. And it is perfectly okay and give yourself grace if you are snappy or if you handle a situation in a way that other people see as less than perfect. The next piece of advice she says is to invest in your mental health. Um, find a great therapist, find some sense of spirituality or some other way to have an understanding of yourself in yourself for yourself. I'm not sure that I can really speak to anything more than that, except for like therapy is bomb, go get some. The next piece of advice, thirdly, Find a strong basis of support. Make sure your family knows that they are in for the long haul. And if you are halfway across the world and experience something and you are alone, you're going to need them on standby to help you out. Don't be afraid to lean on them. That's natural and that's normal. And that's what support is for. And then lastly, and I think this is so important for people of all colors, no matter what shade your skin is, you have got to lawyer up and get educated. Maybe not necessarily like lawyer up, like you don't need to have like a lawyer on standby all the time. Though Shanae makes the point that this is an unregulated industry and people can do whatever they want and will do whatever they want 
sometimes and to have um, some legal backing is not a bad idea. But read your contracts, know what you're getting into, do some research about the countries and the companies that are hiring you and sending you those plane tickets because you can get in some real dangerous situations real quick if you are not educated. And lastly, before I give y'all my sign out and Shanae's information and all of that, I really like want to end this reflection section, reflection section on a happy note. On one hand, it doesn't seem like a realistic thing to do because racism fucking sucks and I don't want to gloss over it or make it sound like it doesn't suck. But what I do want to say is that at one point in the interview, Shanae said, or she kind of asked, like, where is the foothold for artists? Like, where are we the strongest? How, when we have all of these companies and these corporations and these people we're trying to work for, like, what can we do to fortify ourselves? And the answer that she gives is to share information with one another is to have an open dialogue independent of what a company is telling you, of what a circus school or institution is telling you. Bigger than all of that is the network of hardworking, badass acrobats, aerialists, clowns, artists. This circus community is us. Clearly, we can't depend on the big companies, but we can depend on each other. So be there for each other. Yeah, that's all. You can find Shanae Stiletto Booth. Someday I'm going to have her back on the show and I'm going to ask her all the questions like, how'd you get the name Stiletto? Um, <laughs> uh, but you can find her and ask her yourself. She's on Instagram, Shanae Stiletto. Her podcast is Live Like an Acrobat. It's fabulous. It's on all the platforms that you use to listen to this podcast, except Circus Talk. So if you're getting here from Circus Talk, go to another platform and hit up Shanae's podcast because it's dope. And I'm not sure of a website for her, but if you go to her Instagram account, she is giving workshops and other really cool offerings through Aerial Fit Bodies, I think is the company. So go check her out there. And as for me, for aerial training tips and inspiration, you can go to www.theartistathlete.com, my Instagram, the underscore artist underscore athletes, and on Facebook, I'm The Artist Athlete. If you love what you're listening to and want to continue to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete. Thanks for tuning in, friends, fans, and enemies. I'll talk at you next week. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hi, everyone. This is Allie Cooper, owner and coach at the Radical Movement Factory in Santa Cruz, California. I love supporting the Artist Athlete Podcast and the amazing community Shannon has created here. I teach rope and fabric and have a circus conditioning app available on iTunes called Cirque Plus. You can follow me on Instagram at Allie Cooper underscore. And if you find yourself in California, come say hi. Hi, I'm Leah. I hate conditioning. So I created the ABCs of Fitness, a fun, full program of active flexibility, body weight, and cardio with personal daily check-ins to motivate you wherever you are and whatever discipline you do. Join our next 19-day check-in challenge and slide into my DMs on Instagram at ABCs of Fitness. Aloha, my name is Beth Russell and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slack lining, pole, bungee and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and swings and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And um, that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in this city, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and goodbye. Hey there, artists and athletes. This is Andy Smith, owner and artistic director at Saltaire Circus School in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And I want to thank you for contributing to the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you ever find yourself down in Florida, come check us out. Whether you're an artist, athlete, or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we got a place for you.